Genesis chapter 2. And um, Genesis chapter 2, we're talking again about the result of sin, or we're talking about sin. And I, and I just, I, I kind of raced through this toward the end. And, and, and one of the things that we're, we're living in a generational time, um, obviously every generation has had this same struggle, and that is that for whatever reason, their mindset is, is that God does not want the best for us. But somehow God is hiding his best from us. And, and the idea that um, uh, I mentioned, again, in this in prayer time, uh, our governor uh, has now made executive orders that has said, look, no longer can anything that's state um, uh, government funded, uh, counselors or psychologists or psychiatrists or whatever, we can no longer in our state do what's called conversion therapy. Now, if you don't know what conversion therapy is, what that basically is is saying that if a per that they believe that a person is born a homosexual, gay, a lesbian, transgender, whatever, that they're born that way, and that it is wrong to tell them that they can stop being that. That and and for therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists who are paid by the state they can, as of yesterday, no longer practice conversion therapy in any way, shape, or form. Now, if you think that and New York's not the first at this, California, Illinois, and New Jersey had already passed laws. Um, New York is just fourth in line in doing this. Now, really, what's the, the premise behind this? Their mindset is the same as we find in Genesis chapter 2, and that is, is that God does not want the best for you. That God's trying to hide from you what is, what's good for you. God doesn't want you to be all that, that you are capable of being. God wants to hinder you from having what you want. And that's, that's really what, if you look in Genesis chapter 2, that literally is what um, the beginning of this, and I'm, just, and I'm just, for context, in Genesis 2.17, but the tree of the knowledge, back up to verse 15. And the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress and to keep. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat, freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. Thou shalt surely die. And then if you go over to Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, and it says, Woman, ye shall not surely die. Now, here's the thing is, is really, if you ask yourself, you could just ask a simple question. Who are you going to take the word of? You're going to take God's word or you're going to take Satan's word? I mean, that's really what it says in Genesis 2. Yeah, the day you eat of it, you're going to die. In Genesis 3, 4, Satan says, no, you're not going to die. One of them is lying because both statements cannot be true. Satan he, he tells them in verse 5, for God doth know. Here's, in other words, Satan, Satan is calling God the liar. And he said, here's why God's lying to you. God's lying to you because he knows that the day that you, in the day that you eat thereof, that your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's why God, Satan says to, to Adam and Eve, look, that's why God doesn't want you to do that tree. He wants to keep you in ignorance. He doesn't want you to be everything that you're capable of being. And the reality is, is, is it was this suggestion that God did not have man's best interest in heart. And, I, and as we kind of move on, let me, let me have you turn to John 8 and just let's just clarify this. This is where we are when it comes to the issue of sin. And sometimes, Sometimes, um, whether it's a preacher or whether it's another Christian who stands and says, look, this is what the Word of God says, and they take a stand, they're shown as, as intolerant. They're told, okay, you know, you're, you're not tolerant. You're, you're homophobic. Um, you're, you're hateful. You're spiteful. And sometimes Christians can have a hateful attitude and spirit. I agree. But we need to recognize that sometimes the things that people say may be right, though the spirit behind them may be wrong. And if a preacher stands homosexuality is sin, by the way, homosexuality is sin. It's wrong. Now he can say that the bitter spirit does not negate what he says. 
it negates the attitude. Okay, can I, can I ask you this? If, if every time we wanted to know genuineness, and we're not going to believe somebody who's not genuine, what store would you ever shop in? Now, if you don't get what I mean by that, is ask the average person who works in a store if they really like working there, if their products actually are the best, and what will they probably end up telling you at some point in the process? Well, I'm telling you that because I'm, I'm paid to. I'm, I'm made to. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying because I really believe in the product. I, I, don't know many, I don't know many people who actually believe in the, the average, everyday work, run-of-the-mill employee that believes in Walmart. I mean, does everybody understand that? I mean, I mean, if you ask the average Walmart employee, why are you working here? What would they tell you? Yeah. They're not, they're not there because they believe in the company. They're not there because they, they agree with the product. They just, they're getting a paycheck. And if you don't believe me, just see how they do their job. See how bitter their spirit about the company. You say, what does that have to do with this? It has everything to do with this because sometimes there are some people who will stand up and say, look, this is right or this is wrong, and they'll do it with a wrong spirit, and what will end up happening is, is we'll ignore what's said because the individual had a bitter spirit. Now look, they, they need to the answer for that bitter spirit. I get that. But see, God said that tree and you're going to die. Was that the truth? Absolutely, was the truth. But say, no, 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 that's not the truth. Hide from you what he wants. God's trying to hide his best from you. And so we find in John chapter 8, Jesus is trying to clarify really about who Satan is. And look at verse 44. He specifically just hypocrites when he says, ye are of your father the devil and the lust of your father he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is what? There's no truth in him. He's thinking Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. I believe when Satan is saying, look, God die. But see, sin in, it's entered in under this guise of deception. That God does not have the best in mind for us. That when God says, Keep yourself pure. Keep your purity. Keep your virginity. You do not give virginity to anybody but the person that you marry after you marry. Oh, that's old fun. So pass hay. No. It's, it's the right thing. It's the best thing. Why? Because God said so. Because it is. Look, even if it doesn't make sense to us, it's, if God says it, it's still the right thing. Instead of us saying, you know, accept this when it makes sense to me, why don't we just take out of his word? We'll just take out of his word. Well, I don't understand. I don't understand how a car works. I, I don't. I mean, I, I, I get it. I mean, I know the, the, you know, the pistons. And, but if you ask me to take a car apart, you better have somebody else prepared to put it back together. Because I have no idea how to put the thing back together. 1-800-DIAL-OUTEN. You know? Yeah. I mean, the fact is, is, is I don't know how, it, I don't know, I know I, I can pull, I can see, and I can throw the bolt off to the side, and, and then once all the bolts out, I can set that piece off to the side. But I don't know how it works. You know what I do? I trust that somebody who's smarter than me knows how it works. Folks, there are a lot of things in our lives we don't understand. But God says in his word certain things, and we need to take God at his word. And that's what God was asking in Genesis 2. He was asking Adam, and he take my word. And Satan says, no, don't take God's word. And that's where sin came into the world. Now, what's the result of sin? Let's, let's look at them here real quick. I've got five of them. We won't spend a lot of time on each one. Romans 5. Actually, we're just going to look at four today. Look at Romans chapter 5. What's the result of sin? Now, what did... What, in Genesis 2, the day that you eat of that tree, you shall what? Okay, look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. It says, Wherefore, as by one man, 
and death by sin, and so death hath pa or death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. What has passed of sin now into the world? Death. Death. The Bible fifty one five, David said in sin I was conceived. Now that doesn't mean the act of conception is sin. It's David's way of saying, I was born a sinner. Romans 5, 12 is the same idea. I, I want you to, 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 to James chapter 1. I'm going to come there in just a second. I'm going to read a verse in Psalm 58. And then we're going to go to, to uh, James 1. In Psalm 58 and verse 3, it says, The change from the womb, they are gone astray as born speaking lies. Again, a person is not perfect. They are born with a sinful nature. Now, can I ask this, since this is Sunday school, how contrary is that to our world's philosophy today? What's our world's philosophy when it comes to where does sin come from? Where does sin come from? And the world's philosophy. Anybody know? Yeah, from the culture that we live in. A child, the, the mindset of our Christians need to be, mind, be careful of this. When we hold a brand new newborn baby, our first thought is, what, what's this little, pure, innocent child? Are they pure and innocent? No. What are they? They're, they're sinners. They're sinners just like every other person is a sinner. They are a sinner into that sin. Then if, then if you look at, at James chapter 1 and look at verse 15, notice the progression. Look, you know, we're born, look at verse 15 here, James 1, he says, then when lust hath and, and sin when it is finished brings forth what? See the progression? Lust brings forth sin when it's finished. See, we, we don't want to we're sinners. You know our problem? We have no problem telling everybody else that they're sinners. We have no problem with that. It's admitting ourselves as a sinner. It's admitting, it's looking at myself in the mirror and saying, you know what? I am a sinner. What, what would happen, what would happen in our lives if we acknowledged our own sin? If we looked at ourselves in the mirror, instead of justifying that person did that, that person this, and we, we got all our focus on everybody else and how they failed and what they did and what they've done wrong. If we would take the time to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm a sinner. And we humbled ourselves and said, you know what, as a sinner, I need to look at other people as a sinner looking at sinners. How would our attitude change? What would our attitude be? I mean, if you, because if, if you look at people and you say, well, he did that horrible thing. He did that horrible thing. How many people have you hurt? How many people have you done wrong by? I mean, we've talked about sin. It's not just wrong, but it's also not doing that which is good or right. How many people have you failed? Why well, did I didn't kill them. I didn't beat them up. Okay, but did you love them like you should have? Did you have compassion? You should talk about that. Why not? You know why we don't want to talk about it? Because it, it causes us to realize that we ourselves are sinners. You see, and it, I believe if we see ourselves as we are, there would be a lot more compassion. There would be a lot more understanding there will be a lot more mercy. But see, sin, see, bringeth forth death. And that's what death has come into the world. So often, blame God for the results of sin. But man is responsible for his own actions. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Thessalonians. Let me show you this. We, we again, we're in a culture that's trying to justify behavior. This, and this justification of cultures is right across the board. This justification of it's, whether it's in, 
It's in, um, uh, well, what Cuomo did yesterday. He's justifying and saying that people are born homosexual. Born, born this, they're born that. Then you've got other I wasn't born this way. Because of the, the struggles of my life, the things that people did to me, this is why I do these things now. And, and when it comes down to it, nobody wants to take responsibility for themselves. They want to blame their, their everything on somebody else. Uh, it's not my fault that I have lung cancer. It's the cigarette manufacturers. It's not my fault that, you know, I shoot a person. It's the gun manufacturers. It's not my fault, you know, I'm a drug addict. It's that the police and the drug pushers. See, we can go right across the board. It's not my fault. It's not my fault that I have those other Christians who failed me. It's not my fault that I have a bitter spirit. See, it's all the same thing. Nobody wants to take responsibility. But if you look in 1 Thessalonians, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians, I said first, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and look at verses 9. 2 Thessalonians says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and sign and lying wonders and with all what? Of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive of the truth for this them strong that they should believe in other words God says look if they want to believe a lie I'm going to let them I'm going to let them believe that lie I'm going to let them live in that deception why that they all might be damned now we could speak about the children of Israel as an example of this the children of Israel as a whole not as individuals but as a whole the Jews have rejected they said, we're not going to believe him as our Messiah. They allow themselves to be deceived. Look, you and I have a personal accountability. Jeremiah 9 tells us the best. It says that the heart is the issue. The heart is desperately wicked above all things who can know. You cannot trust your feelings. You cannot trust, because your feelings are going to change day to day. I cannot trust my feelings. Why? But see, what's the result of sin? Well, death. Death is a result of sin. Now, I, I know that the idea of that personal accountability is a little of a sidetrack, but I think you need to see it. Now, turn, if you would, back to Romans 5 again. What's another result, I guess, is the best. It's actually how I wrote it in the notes, but the result of sin. Well, first of all, death. Second of all, look at Romans chapter 5. Let me, let me have, give you the verses, and then see if you can figure it out. Romans 5, verses 18 and 19, okay? Romans 5, 18 and 19. What's another, what happens in, in Romans 5, 18 and 19? What's another kind of penalty or result of sin? What happens? Romans 5, 18 and 19. Hmm? Okay, but let's read the verses and sing. Romans chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, it says, Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so the righteousness of one, the free gift, came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Okay, why are my children sinners? Okay, because of Adam, but, but also because of me. Where, where, did, where did the children get the sinful nature from? I mean, ultimately, we can trace all the way back to Adam. I get that. But where did they get it? They got it from the generation that was right in front of them. Where did that generation get it from? It was in front of them. That's why, the, by the way, that's why the virgin birth is so important. Because Jesus Christ being born of a virgin, what does that mean he was not a part of in the male line? Because the male line is where the sin line goes through. He's born of a virgin, therefore he did not inherit sin. He didn't inherit sin. That's why the virgin birth is so important. You know, my children are because I was a sinner. It's all your fault, Dad. 
Okay? I can trace it back. Well, it actually was my dad. He gave it to me. I look back and I characteristics in some of you that I, I, I don't know your fathers. But chances are I could probably, if I knew your father, I might be able to pick certain qualities. I don't know if Roger's dad had hair or not. Did he have hair? Okay, lots of hair. So where did this come from? Your mother, your mother was bald. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I've seen pictures of Alton's dad. He looks an awful lot like his dad. Looks like your mom too, but I can see your dad in you too. See, we, we, we understand that physical characteristics, but what he's talking about is that sin part of that generational sharing. And that's the result of sin. That's, that's the result of sin. See, we, we genetics, physically. My, my grandfather died of heart disease. My father died of heart disease. So I'm in the crosshairs. So I need to make sure whenever I can do what I can to try to prevent that, whether it's by uh, exercise, whether medications, whatever. And try to, but see, generally speaking, I didn't, as a baby, I didn't go, oh, you know what? I, I, I want to have heart disease. I didn't, I, when I was born, I didn't want to go, oh, I want to be a sinner. But I was. See, that's the result of sin, death, and world. But it also is this, this sin. That's the result of sin. And the only way that this can be broken, I guess, if you will, is, um, is not being born of a man, which is impossible other than a virgin birth. So sin divides, or excuse me, sin passes from generation. That's one of the results of sin. Number three, turn to Isaiah chapter 5, or 59, excuse me. I'm looking at some other notes here. Isaiah 59. Well, it brings, it's past the penalty of the generation. That's part of the sinful curse. And then look at Isaiah chapter 59 and look at verse 2. See if you can figure out this one. What's a result of sin coming into the world? Isaiah 59, 2. This, this one's a little bit more obvious. Yeah. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have... Okay, what, what, what does sin cause? It causes a separation in our what? In our relationship with God. Why is that? Why does sin separate? You know, I mean, good night if God loves us. Why, why should sin be allowed to separate us from him? I mean, you know, he loves us, doesn't he? Why, I mean, why, I mean, because he's holy? Well, yeah, but so? I'm playing devil's advocate for just a second. So? So he's holy. Okay. My wife and I, obviously, we were just coughing and sneezing. It was, it was funny. A couple people were like, you know, I, I could tell Sunday. We feel a little bit better than we did last Sunday. But I could tell last Sunday and even today. Why do people back up from us? We have cooties. And you don't want our cooties, do you? And we tried. We tried our best to stay away, back up from people and so forth. We tried our best. Because we didn't want to share that with you. And we don't think anything about it. I wasn't sitting back. Well, that self-righteous person wouldn't shake my hand just because I coughed into it. That person stayed back from me. It's funny. I watched a couple people throughout the, they knew I was, knew I was and I could, I could tell they, they had conversations with tables and everything between me and them. I wasn't offended. I'm not stupid. I know what you were doing. But I wasn't. I knew you were trying to keep yourself what? Trying to keep yourself from getting. I understand that. Then can I ask you a question? Why in the world are we upset with a holy God who's trying to keep himself away from sin?
We're asking sometimes, if we're not careful, we'll become so self-righteous that we're going to ask something of God we're not even willing to do ourselves. You see, and, and I'll take a step further. Our God, that he's trying to bridge the gap between his holiness and our Christ down the cross for our sins. He's not trying to from our sins. He's trying to cure us of our sins. That's what he's trying to do. But our sin is us from our God. That's what Isaiah is here in Isaiah 59.2. I thought, I thought interesting. Do me a favor. Turn to Exodus chapter 34. Let me, let me show you a couple of, of places where really the same talks about the iniquity. Look at Exodus 34. And look at verse 7. Actually, again, for sake of context, let's go back up to verse 5. Exodus 34, verse 5. And it says, And the Lord and stood there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. In other words, God's, he said, I want to show mercy. And I, that doesn't make it sin. Can, can I ask this? How so many times we want God to forgive our sins, but not somebody else's. We want some if uh, if I I'm say I lost my temper, or maybe I found my temper, and I, and, and I got, and I, and I blew, and I looked, you know, maybe an hour later, I went to her and I said, you know what, see, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. Um, I, my flesh just got the best of me. I'm sorry. Please forgive me for that. I, I, will you forgive me? What if she looked at me and said, No. Why not? Because I don't want to. Why? Now I'm thinking, what else have I done wrong? What have I, what have I so damaged the relationship? And she looks at me and says, you know what? I don't believe you. And let's say she reminds me before she had blown up at me. And she came to me and tried to put her arms around me and say, look, I'm sorry for losing my temper with you. And I just stood there as stiff as a board. Why, are you forgiving me? I'll think about it. You see, our problem, Christian, so many times is we want to be treated differently than we're willing to treat others when it comes to the issue of forgiveness. We want all of our sins to be free. Is there anybody in here who would say, you know what, I have sins that I know cannot be forgiven and I'm not expecting and I don't want anybody to forgive me for those things. I don't think anybody's dumb enough to say that. Every one of us in this room, no matter what we've done, we want to be forgiven. But for whatever reason, we somehow will come up with some justification not to forgive somebody else. And what does that sin do? It separates. It separates. He's talking about our sins have separated from God. Instead of, instead of blaming ourselves and instead of taking accountability for ourselves and our own actions, you know what we do? We blame God. We say it's his fault. He allowed to us, or he, he allowed, or he, he, he's not shown me, his, he's not, he's not there when I needed him, and we'll blame him. Now, I'm not saying that other people hurting us is, is not harmful, but the result of sin is it divides between us and our God. Turn over to Psalm 32.
Psalm 32 and verse 5. David I, I, is writing this. It's, just, it's a psalm of confession. And he says in verse 5, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. Now, this is a dumb question. Was David really hiding his sin? No. So when David says, I'm, I'm not hiding my sin, he's not saying, God, I'm revealing something to you that you don't know. What's he doing? What's he doing? When he says, I'm not hiding my sin anymore. Is, is, he, is he taking the cover off so that you see it? Because God saw it. That wasn't the issue. What's he doing by, by saying, I'm not hiding anymore? Yeah, he's admitting it. He's saying, I'm, Lord, I, I'm admitting that I've done this thing. I've sinned against you. See, sin divides from our God. And then last of all, turn to, to Romans chapter 6. What's the result of sin? That's physical death as well as spiritual separation, or just spiritual death, if you will. Then sin, generation to the next, that's the result of sin. Sin is our relationships, it's in, it divided us from our God, the iniquity has separated us. And they can look in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. What's the of sin? Now here in, in Romans 6, 23, when he says the wages of sin is death, what death is he talking about? Is he talking about just physical death? No, he's talking about death where? Spiritual death, and that spiritual death takes place in what location? In hell. It says that, that sin, death and sin, uh, second death, cast into hell. Revelation tells us that. See, the wages has the idea of going. Now, now here's the thing, and, and I thought this was interesting, and let me, let me, let me just close with this. Um, Alton... Which right reminds me, you still got to get me that invoice for those parts. He fixed my car, and uh, he's got to get those invoice parts because I can't pay him. I can pay you a dollar, but I know it's a lot more than the. When we look at Romans, we have the concept of um, getting a paycheck. You work 40 hours, and then you get a paycheck. But that's really not what this is talking about. Let me, let me give you the illustration that he's using by the verbiage and the words that he's using. In, in, the, in, in, um, in the day with the Roman soldiers, the Roman soldiers, and even today, our military men are the same way. They're taken care of. For those of you that were in the military, um, when you were in act, for those that were in active service, shape or form, when you were in active service, who bought the uniforms? <laughs> well, exactly. We did the taxpayer. But you didn't walk with the price tag and go, ooh, a Gucci uniform, $5,000. I'm not buying that one. No, you got whichever one. They measured you. They gave you the size. Okay, when you went into the, uh, to the kitchen, when you went into the mess hall, was there a cashier? at the beginning or the end of the, of the line in the mess hall? I mean, only if you went to one of those that you, the optional. Who paid? I mean, obviously, who gave you? They did. Who gave you the gun? They did. And then every once in a while, every week, every month, I'm not sure, cycles, they would then either you or deposit into your let me ask you a question. What was your salary? Right. All of it was. The fact that you provided your house, right? That was part of being the, the average soldier does not get paid what he could or should get paid if he was working in a private occupation. But along with that, what also is part of that? the things that are taken care of. The fact that he 
uh, to the hospital and not expect to pay. He can expect, expect to pay in the mess hall for the average meals, their uniforms, their gun, their weaponry, the training that they receive. They don't pay for that. And they even get the whole packet, right? That's this word in Romans 6.23. The word wage, it's not check 40 week cycle. It is called everything happening. Because you know what? We're all sinners. Not just we don't do that which is right. When we reject, we don't receive. About the idea of the unpardonable sin. What's the unpardonable sin? Committing suicide? No. It's rejecting Jesus Christ, rejecting the Holy Spirit when He's drawing into your heart and saying, Look, I want you. God can't forgive. See, it's, it's the whole package. It's not what I'm doing. Get something. It's the whole package of who I am. It's everything. It's the the wage of my sin than is death. It's not like, okay, I do something, I get something in return. It's I'm getting this because of who I am. I'm a sinner. Everything that I do is based in sin before I trust Christ. Even that which is good, what does the Bible say? Our righteousness are as filthy rags. See, that's what sin is. The wages of sin, the, the, another use the, 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 the complete package of sin, the stipends, the, the wages of sin is death. But I'm glad the rest of the verse says, but the, way, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we're going to pick up on, next week we're going to start talking about the whole issue of sin. This was just talking about sin. Now we're going to start talking about salvation. And we're going to talk about why the blood atonement of the Old Testament sacrifices was not sufficient to take away our sins. Why Jesus had to die. Why he had to die. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about uh, justification, righteousness. We're going to talk about key words as we get ahead. So, Father, I ask your blessing now upon these thoughts. Help us, Lord, to recognize what sin is. Help us, Lord, to see the sin of our own lives, my life. Lord, help me to see the bitterness, the pride, the arrogance in my own heart. Help me to humble myself. Lord, help me, Lord, to see myself for who I really am, a sinner saved by the grace of God. Thank you, Lord, for saving grace. We ask your blessing upon the time to come. May you be pleased in all of this. In Jesus' name, amen.